set, set. All right, all right, thank you. Appreciate that, I feel the love. Thank you guys. 60 years, you guys are looking good for 60, baby. Looking good, you're carrying 60 well. You know, I did a little uh, research back into 1962, and there were some things that were different back then. For instance, back in 1962, if you wanted to make a phone call, well, you had to use uh, something like this, a rotary phone. And uh, you'd have to dial it and wait for all the zeros to go around, uh, you know, like all the things. Uh, now, you know, phones have literally no buttons at all, and they don't even have headphone jacks. So there's that. Back then, um, Let's go to the next slide. Back then, if you wanted to get gasoline, it was 25 cents a gallon. Come on, somebody. Can you imagine? 25 cents a gallon. Now, well, now you can't get anything for 25 cents. I mean, you can't even get change at stores anymore. Even little bubblegum machines, they're not 25 cents anymore. Like, like we're, that's, all, that's all over. Back then, if you wanted to watch TV at ABC, NBC, and CBS, that was it. And they aired from 6 in the morning until midnight. If you woke up in the middle of the night and turned your TV on, it was just static till the next morning. Now, well, we have all the channels for every show that's ever been aired in all of history. It still feels like there's nothing to watch half the time, doesn't it? You know what I'm saying? All right. Back then, 1962, the number one television show was the Beverly Hillbillies. The country folks that went to Beverly Hills. Now you could argue what the number one show is, but the most streamed show last year was Criminal Minds. So, you know, you go, we went from Beverly Hillbillies to serial killers and, uh, and hunting them. So there it is. Uh, back then, the 1962, the Green Bay Packers won the Super Bowl. Come on. And then now, still not the Dallas Cowboys. Just, just saying. Still not the Dallas Cowboys. Maybe in the next 60 years. You know, one way to think about Central back then is to think of a simple folding chair. You know, these 26 folding chairs represent the first 26 people that gathered in Odd Fellows Hall off 9th Street and Ogden, uh, right in the shadow of the Fremont Street experience in downtown Las Vegas. Uh, the building would have looked like this. We've got a picture here that we'll bring up. And uh, people wonder about like Odd Fellows and Rebecca's. Well, that was a society group that had lodges all over the world and they would basically rent their building out. So there was no real connection other than we rented the building on Sunday mornings and uh, used it. And uh, they would also rent it out on Saturday nights to different groups who would hold dances and parties. And so there was a whole group of people, and as the church continued to meet there, eventually there was a committee, because churches love their committees. There was a committee that's job was to come in and clean up all the beer bottles and the trash and everything else from the Saturday night dances and parties and transform the place into a church on Sunday morning. And I gotta tell you, I love that part of the story because it's just like central in our heart for people that we would meet precisely where there were parties the night before and transform that into a place of worship. And so that's what they did. By the way, the building is still there. People are always like asking, like, is that building still there? What is it? Uh, it's still there. Um, it's no longer Odd Fellows Hall. This is what it looks like today. It's a dog training and grooming facility, the Hydrant Club. So if you're ever down in downtown Las Vegas, 9th and Ogden, check it out. You can drive by, and uh, there it is. And if you want to get your dog groomed, well, there you go as well. But from those humble beginnings, God continued to move through the people of Central, and again and again they came to a crossroads where they had to decide, were they willing to take risks? Were they willing to step out in faith? Were they willing to pour themselves out for the sake of others? And at each kind of marker on the journey, the Central family was willing to risk again and again and again. And I could go through a list of all the different relocations, all the different miracles related to building campaigns, all the different people that sacrificed for the church to get to where it is today. Because you may not realize this, but Central is 100% locally owned and operated. So there's, there's no one else except the people around you that fund the church, 
that plan for the church, that lead the church. It's always been a church dedicated to the glory of God, to the grace of Jesus Christ, and it's by people and for people. So, you know, it's pretty amazing to look around at Central at the different locations and to think, everyday people built this. Everyday people funded this. Everyday people made this happen. Um, a couple of things haven't changed since 1962. One is our commitment to the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, and aren't we all, that we all need his grace, and his grace is available. Second thing is a heart for people who aren't, you know, we love the people that are here and are part of our church family, but we've always tried to remember the people that aren't here as well, that need God in their life, that need his grace in their life. The people that were just like us two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago or 30 years ago, right? Before we experienced the grace and the goodness of God in their lives. And that's always been our heart. So I wanna look with you at celebrating history today and I wanna talk about how we celebrate history to really be inspired to make our own history. You know, we celebrate history, but part of that is the inspiration to make our own history history, and every day we are making history in our lives. So let's go back to the book of Acts. Jesus, in Acts chapter 1, when he ascends into heaven, in his kind of final encounter in the book of Acts with his disciples, this is what he says. I'm going to read this scripture. When we get to the highlighted red word, just say it out loud, uh, real loud here with me, but Jesus breaks it down this way. He says to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my what? witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That word witness is a big word. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm a witness. You're a witness. Now, a witness is just somebody that sees and hears something and reports it, right? You're a witness. Jesus is saying, my followers, his disciples, but also us, our call is to be witnesses, to report back what God has done in our lives, what we've seen God do in the lives of our friends and family, what we see God do in our own faith community. We simply witness to what God has done. By the way, in the early centuries of the Christian church, the first few hundred years, that um, there was so much religious persecution under the reign of Rome that people would witness and testify with their lives. There was a big push in different pockets for people to renounce their faith in Jesus, and many of those early believers refused to do so, and many of them were killed because they refused to renounce their faith in Jesus. And so the word witness historically actually became synonymous, the Greek word, with the English word martyr. It's the same word. So to witness in some seasons, and even now in some pockets around the world, is to be willing to testify even to the end to what God has done in your life. Jesus says we aren't alone in witnessing because the power of the Holy Spirit will guide us. And that word power, we get our word in English, dynamite from that word. The dynamite power of the Holy Spirit can empower us. And then the thrust is, he says, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That's like going out in, in, uh, in like circles. You could think of it. Jerusalem is like where they were located. Then Judea is the surrounding area. Samaria, they continue to go out all the way to the ends of the earth. It's like saying, you're going to be my witnesses, like first to your family, and then maybe to your friends, and then to your acquaintances, and then to the people that you haven't even met. Jesus gave his disciples, and I believe us, an outward focus in his last commission before he ascended into heaven. He said, go be my witnesses to all peoples. And so that's our call today. But you know, the pull of the church, the pull on really any of us, is to get comfortable. It would have been really easy for the central family when the church got to two or 300 people and was self-sustaining and all of that to just look inward and just be comfortable and be satisfied with where they were. It's really easy to do that. Even the church in Jerusalem basically does that. Jesus gives them this challenge and then you know what happens? The church basically stays in Jerusalem. And when you read through the book of Acts, they don't really leave the city of Jerusalem 
until a wave of religious persecution comes upon the church and they're forced to leave. They're scattered, right, as they run for their lives and God actually uses their scattering for them to take the message of Jesus to Judea and Samaria and all the way to the ends of the earth. It's easy to look in and get comfortable. So how do we keep making history for the next 60 years? Two simple thoughts today. One is this. We got to celebrate history, which is what we're doing. We got to celebrate history. And I want you to think about this. In the first 60 years of Central's history, we have a record of 153,380 people that have named Jesus the leader and forgiver of their lives in this church. A hundred I mean, that's amazing. That's amazing. 49,442 people have been baptized over the first 60 years. You got to just turn to the person next to you and say, only God. Only God does that, man, because this church is not that good. And we're not. Uh, nor are we special any more than any other church is special. We're not unique. We're not anything other than a local church filled with sinful, broken people who need the goodness and grace of God. And there are a lot of great churches in our cities, in our communities. There are a lot of great churches, and we love them, and we support their work. But it's our 60th, so it's also okay to celebrate what God has done in our unique church. And one of the things that he's done is touch so many people's lives to come home to him and to start that spiritual journey with him. Uh, I think of some people like uh, Jeff Sage. Jeff Sage, over 20 years ago, before I came to Central, was a uh, uh, CFO of a very large gaming company, managing the finances, all of that. He walked into Central and God got a hold of his heart and God transformed his life and God worked in a powerful way and he began to lean in and for the last 20 plus years, he's served on the Central staff team and managed all of our finances. Which is why, uh, you know, our auditors who audit a lot of nonprofits and different organizations have said that uh, Central is, in their estimation, in the top 1% of all nonprofits in the country and how well our finances are run. But that's somebody that's a product of the church. And... Um, I'm grateful for him. I'm grateful for people like Michelle. Uh, I talked to Michelle just this last week. She's a volunteer in the church, but 18 years ago, Michelle was here serving before one of our services. And back then, we had showers that were available. Uh, we currently don't have those available at our Henderson location anymore, but we had showers, and so the homeless, we, they would come in before services and they could take a shower, get cleaned up, we would feed them and do some things for them. And so Michelle was standing there and a guy walked in and he was really at the end of a, end of his rope. He just wanted to take his own life. And basically, she um, looked at this guy and she said, "You look like you need a hug." And he said, at that moment, all he wanted to do was put a gun in his mouth. And he said, "You don't want to hug me." It's like I haven't had a bath in three months. And she just walked up and gave him a hug. And this guy, he said, that was the moment when God cracked a door open in his heart. He was angry at God, he was angry at others, and he just said that was, that was the moment. And over time, he began to come and attend the church and sit in the back and uh, come to find out he had been a nurse, he was a professional bass pro fisherman, had been featured on ESPN, you know, had a whole life and career, but uh, through a series of losses, began to lean into addiction that got heavier and heavier, and pretty soon he just surrendered to it and walked away from everything and was sleeping in a field for months. But God grabbed a hold of his heart and turned his life around, and now, you know, all these years later, he's led a powerful ministry for years uh, to the homeless, and God has used him in an amazing way. But listen, in my estimation, and I think he would agree with this, it all goes back to a simple volunteer named Michelle, still serving right over here in this hallway every week. God used a hug to change a guy's life. I think of Gabriella. Gabriella bottomed out, went through a tough divorce and faced a lot of medical expenses and when she sent her kids off to the first day of school without any uh, school supplies, she felt like a failure and she decided that she would work the streets that night, that she would sell her body 
to support her kids, to get her kids what they needed when they went back to school for day two. And she said when her kids came home from school, she had already made plans for them to be watched that night. But they had backpacks and school supplies and all the things that they needed. And she said, where did you get all this stuff? And the kids didn't really know. They just got it through the public school system. But they pulled a letter out, and the letter said it was a gift from the Central Church family. And she said, she said, I, I held that letter next to my heart and felt like for the first time in years, God hadn't abandoned me. And she began a spiritual journey. I can still remember her face when she was baptized. God began to move and work in her life. More recently, when I think about our history, I think about when all the food pantries uh, shut down after the COVID shut down, except for two, uh, Central was one of them. And we knew there was a huge need across the different cities where we have locations to serve food and provide food for people. And we went out in the very first day of the shutdown all the way through that. We were out there serving food the whole time. And what I think really moved me, I wasn't prepared for it, is a while back I met with one of our volunteers who was moving. And uh, she said, before I move, I want to tell you something. She said, that first day of the shutdown on the news, I saw you guys out putting food in the backs of cars. And she said, remember back then, we didn't know anything about all, co all the COVID things. You know, there were a lot of unknowns. And she said, I just remember looking and you guys didn't have masks on. I mean, we didn't know, you know, like you didn't have masks on, you're just out there serving people. And she said, I remember thinking like, those people could die serving Christ and serving other people. And she said, wait, wait, wait. She said, this is what I wasn't ready for. She said, I just said to myself, well, if my pastors are willing to die to serve Christ, then I'll die with them if that's what it comes to. I mean, I was bawling my eyes out. Like literally, she's, you know, she's like, are you okay? I'm like, Pfft. it's hardcore. And she did come out and she served all through the shutdown. She was out there, you know, slinging food boxes with us. And we've been doing that. I mean, Thousands of our amazing volunteers have stepped out in the greatest unknowns of our lifetime and served others in the name of Christ. Um, over 900 now pop-up food pantries, and it's still going strong. It's amazing what you have done, what the Central family has done. There's a lot we could celebrate in our history. We could celebrate launching multiple campuses across the Las Vegas Valley. We could celebrate a campus that's... Uh, uh, started in a home and went to a garage and then eventually to a high school and now in the Central Commercial Building in Kingman, Arizona that's doing a great job. We could celebrate meeting in uh, beach bar locations in Florida or Morelia, Mexico or Newcastle, Australia or all the things God does online or a dozen different locations inside prisons. There's a lot we could celebrate, but listen, all of that is in service to one end, and that is change lives by the grace of Jesus Christ, right? That's all that matters. And so I just want to ask you, maybe this is just a great visual moment for us, if you came to faith in Jesus Christ through the ministry of Central, would you just stand where you are and remain standing for just a moment? You, hold your applause, because I've got several of these, right? If you came to faith in Christ through the ministry of the church, just stand where you are, just remain standing. If you were baptized through the ministry of Central, would you stand where you are and just remain standing? If you went through marriage challenges, marriage struggles, and, and God worked in your life and helped bring you through it all, would you stand where you are and remain standing? If you went through addiction and came through it, if you went through a difficulty and a crisis, but God grabbed a hold of you and rescued you through the ministry of the church, would you stand and remain standing? If you found hope and healing through the ministry of Central, would you stand and remain standing? Now just look around. That's the history we celebrate. The history of what Jesus has done in people's lives. That's what it's all about. Now go ahead and have a seat because I want you to think about this. 
If you stood today, your life has been profoundly impacted by somebody who sat in one of these seats in downtown Las Vegas 60 years ago. You didn't know them, they didn't know you. Almost all of them have passed on by now. But their sacrifice, their prayer, their involvement is what made a church like Central available when you needed a place like Central, right? And so we celebrate that, and we celebrate our history, but we don't, we don't simply celebrate history to stop there. We celebrate history to be inspired to make our own history, and that's the second thought I wanna share with you, not only to celebrate history and the past, but to make history in your own life. You know, this past year, my wife Lori and I celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. Yeah, come on, somebody. She needs an award or something, man, 25 years. But like, so that our anniversary is December 28th. So the first mistake I made was it's right after, as a pastor, it's right after like a million Christmas services, you know? So every time we get to our anniversary, I'm exhausted and still trying to recover, right? But this year, it's the 25th, it's gotta be significant. Challenges like Omicron was running loose and we were tired and all the res COVID restrictions and, you know, we're just trying to figure out what to do. We thought about taking a trip, and then we're like, ah, oh, too much of a hassle. You know, we went through, we decided, well, we're just gonna do a staycation. We booked a, a hotel room on the strip. We're just gonna hang out, celebrate one night, it'll be great. And then we got kind of close to that, and we're tired, and you know, it felt like there were more and more restrictions layered on in that window, and we're like, ah, oh, you know what, it's just not worth it. We're not even gonna do that. We'll just go out to dinner, right? So we got all dressed up. We're gonna go to dinner. We went to a new restaurant we'd never tried before, and I'm just telling you about halfway through, we're both just sort of moving our food around the plate. We just kind of look at each other. You don't want to be negative, you know, it's your 25th, and you don't want to, it's like, this isn't good. <laughs> I'm thankful, but it tastes like cardboard. <laughs> yeah. So we decide, well, let's just go home and we'll watch a movie. I mean, how lame can you get on your 25th wedding anniversary? What'd you do? Oh, we, 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 ate, we ate half our food and went home and watched a movie. So, so we went home, there was a brand new 007 James Bond movie. It had just dropped. You can't go wrong with 007, right? It's 007. There have been like 500,000 of them, and, you know, they, they got to be good. It's 007. So we sit down. We put 007 on. I don't know if it was me, if it was the food, if it was the night. That's the worst James Bond movie I've ever seen in my life. I mean, halfway through, I look over, and my wife is nodding off, like nodding off. And I said, do you want to finish? And the determination in her voice was so real. She's like, it's our 25th anniversary. We will finish. We will finish. So we watched James Bond. And we're gonna make it right on the 26th or before. I'm telling you, we're not done. But um, that was a great time because even though everything went wrong, we still laughed and had great conversation and celebrated over the years. And you know, the truth is, we made history on our 25th wedding anniversary. It's just not a headline kind of history. It's an everyday kind of history, you know what I mean? I mean, sometimes making history doesn't feel historic. Sometimes making history doesn't feel historic. It can feel awkward or boring or even normal. You know, feels like you're just doing what you always do, one more time. Often you're in the middle of some important things in your lives, your relationship with Jesus or in our work as a church and it can just feel like another day. This weekend is a historic moment, and you're here, and some of you, you're just here. You're like, it's just another day. It's just church. You're thinking about what you're going to eat when you leave. <laughs> but God can move in our lives even when we don't always feel moved. God can do his work even through the normal and the mundane things. And so much of life, let's be honest, is the normal and the mundane things. Things. I've talked to some of the original people that were in Odd Fellows Hall, some of the original 26 before they passed on, and they would all say, like, we, we, weren't, we didn't have any grand plans, man. We just went and meet some friends, have church. We weren't thinking anything like this. We were just thinking, we're going to show up, have church, study the Bible, then we're going to go eat lunch. 
but God was working in their lives. I love what, the, uh, uh, when Jesus ascends into heaven in Acts 1, I love what the angel says. Look at this, Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. Two angels speak after Jesus ascends into heaven. He says, men of Galilee, they said, why are you what, standing here? You see that, why are you standing here staring into heaven? I always thought that was funny. I'm like, well, maybe because Jesus just evaporated up into the sky, you know, it's like, I need a minute, right? Who, I'd be like, uh. I don't know what just happened, man. Would I just hallucinate that? Mushrooms, I don't know what's going on. You know, like, what's happening right now? There's just a moment, right? I need a minute. But the angel's like, why are you staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. You know what the angel's saying? He's saying, hey, it's time to get busy. Jesus told you to be his witnesses here, there, all the way to the ends of the earth. Why are you standing here? Why are you staring up into heaven? There's work to do. There's work to do. And I think that's a challenge for us, not simply to celebrate history, but to make history there is work to do. How do we make history as a church family going forward? I want to suggest to you that there are four simple practices that if we were all be willing to engage in them, it may not feel historic, it may not feel significant, it may feel a lot like our 25th anniversary, but if we will all do these practices, Together, over the course of weeks and months and years, God can move in a powerful way through us because we're all pulling on the same rope and it can make a difference. And here's the four practices. One is simply attend the weekend, which you're doing, good job. But the weekend is important. We need you here. We need you to be here. The people around you need your presence. If you're watching online, I'm thrilled you're watching online, but if you're next or near to a physical location, I wanna challenge you to make it a commitment to get to that physical location because other people need you, and whether you realize it or not, you need other people. You need to be able to look around when we pray for people and see tears in their eyes or have your own tears in those moments. You need to see people get baptized and be moved again when you think about your own baptism. You need to look around and Talked to somebody last night. He's like, man, I pulled up and saw one of my coworkers all these years. I had no idea. He went to church. I'm like, hey, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> but you don't get that online, right? You need to have those moments where you're a part and you serve and you see what God's doing in somebody else's life. So I want to challenge everybody. Attend the weekend. Make it a priority. Four practices to make history. The second is invite a friend. Across our locations today, we've got a wall out in the lobby where you can write the name of a friend or family member that you're praying for that may be far from God. Somebody that you're praying God will work in their life powerfully and bring them home to himself. And I want to encourage you to embrace that and always be thinking about going out to the ends of the earth. Who can I witness to, testify to? That doesn't mean I have to beat them over the head with a Bible. It just means I live my life in such a way that they can see in me that I am reporting through my life what God has done in my life or in my friends' lives, in my faith community, right? I'm a witness. And bring them along with you. The third challenge is that we all keep taking next steps. For some of you, I don't know what your next spiritual step may be. It may be you need to forgive somebody. It may be uh, you need to step in and use your gifts to volunteer and serve somebody. It may be a, a next step that's more related to your business life or your family life. It may be a next step more related to, you know, uh, something going on that God's been putting on your heart that you've just continued to, to put off. But here's what I know. If we're all willing to engage in our own next step spiritually, we'll all be growing spiritually. If we're all growing spiritually, spiritually, that's going to mean we're alive and dynamic and growing as a faith community as well. So whatever next steps God is leading you to, lean into that. And the fourth challenge, the fourth practice is to give generously. We would never have gotten to where we are today as a church community without the sacrifice of time and money that so many people put in over, so, over generations at this point. I mean, Somebody paid for the seat you're sitting in. And in a lot of cases, it wasn't you. Hello. Right? Somebody paid for it financially and personally, and they gave of themselves so that when you needed help, help was available. You didn't have to just depend on the government. You didn't just have to look for, you know, some magical thing to fall from the sky. The church was being the church, showing up to help and love and support and give. Somebody made that happen. 
And the tendency at churches is always to think, well, there's some rich people, man. They just wrote big checks. And the truth is, like, at Central, that's not the case. We really don't have people that write massive checks. We have a lot of everyday people, like you and me, that write a lot of sacrificial checks again and again and again. And that's what funds our church. No lie. So, it's, and I love it that way because it's locally owned by the people. So if we're gonna keep taking ground, we're gonna have to continue to sacrifice and give and support like we just did with Feed the City. We have initiatives. If you get bothered around Central, that if we talk about raising money for Feed the City or raising money to help families, raising money at Christmas, like, like you're gonna be really frustrated because a church that is moving out will always have more vision than resources, always. Right? So as you, and trust me, you want to be a part of that kind of church. So you actually want to be in a situation where you're like, ah, oh, man, we need money again. That's good. Because the other option is we got everything we need, and we're taking care of our own, and our doors are kind of closed, and we're looking inward. You see the difference? No, we keep pushing and going outward. So those are four simple practices that if we will all engage in, we can continue to make our own history. It might seem every day. It might seem boring. It might seem like there's nothing really sexy about that. But the truth is, you and I do that week in and week out, week in and week out. I want you to imagine in the future the amount of churches that could be launched, the amount of partnerships that could be made, the amount of prisons that we could impact, the amount of people that could be touched through our online campus. They're already it's going all over the world, but just imagine the amount of impact that could go forward in the future because we were simply faithful to the little things God put in front of us. So, Central is based on a dream. And it's a dream that God's fame would be known. It's a dream that if we lift up Jesus, that he will draw all people to himself. It's a dream that people everywhere, everywhere will discover that there is a God who loves them and that no matter how far from God they may have wondered or how badly they may have failed, his grace through Jesus can give them a new beginning. It's a dream that the hopeless can discover hope and the lonely, the lonely can discover purpose and shattered lives can be put back together. It's a dream where the walls that separate us begin to crumble so that the rich and the poor, the successful and the not so successful, Raiders fans and Chiefs fans, people from every race, culture, background, we can worship together because Jesus is greater than all of our differences, right? He's greater. It's a dream that we not only experience forgiveness, but that we grow to full maturity in Jesus. It's a dream that we serve together, that we make an undeniable impact in our community for the greater good. It's a dream that the good news of Jesus so affects our hearts and our communities that literally crime rates in the areas we go are impacted, that violence is transformed into love, that hearts of parents are turned to their kids and hearts of kids are turned to their parents. It's a dream to infuse everyday people with the hope of heaven and in doing so to bring a little bit of heaven to earth and it's a dream that's happening in fact I want you to meet a few friends sharing a little bit of their story of how it's already happening in their lives check this out uh, my name is Dana my name is Lorraine my name's Tucker my name is blue I'm Shamise I'm Tristan my life before Central was chaotic and messy and I didn't really know or have a place where I belonged and coming to Central really showed me that there was some place that I did belong and was needed. Before I found Central I was a newly divorced homeless mother of three. Um, we found community, we found love, we found acceptance, we found joy and overall we found a very wonderful sense of peace. Um, I was struggling in a lot of areas of life. Um, and when I first showed up at Central, I was looking for a place to try to help me to heal from some of those areas, but also give me a place to fit in. When I first walked into Central, um, I felt nothing but welcomed. I had gotten away from some pretty heavy drugs and wanted to start over. Uh, I was saved here, and you know, this place is home. It's home. 
we were captivated by the fact that they were the hands and feet of Jesus. Uh, walking in there um, changed everything. And we just kind of walked in and we were like, yeah, we're home. Like, this is our home. I was felt comfortable. You find a lot of different people um, who are all in different stages of life, in different stages of their walk with, with Jesus. Never in a million years did I think God would develop me in this way, but he did. And it's because of Central, because of their philosophy and, and strong belief of let's teach you how to follow Jesus now. Let's teach you how to use the gifts that he's given you. I've found a family here and community and friends at Central, and it's really just shown me how much like God's plan and purpose really is true in my own life. Coming to Central changed the trajectory of my life and I was able to find true sobriety. Now I get the opportunity to point people to Jesus and help them follow him in a whole new way. Um, it doesn't matter how lost you feel, how broken you are or think you are, how far you may feel from God, um, you have a home and a place and a seat waiting for you. Since I've been coming to Central, I've felt like I've found and what God has called me to do. Every week I meet new people. Um, I see new smiling faces that I haven't seen before, but I'm just excited to see what God's gonna do to continue to grow Central. All I can see is us expanding and doing it and being available more. Just cool to see what he's going to continue to do um, through the lives of the people at Central. There's so many wonderful things that um, that you experience when you walk into the doors of Central, when you become part of community at Central. As we approach our the 60th anniversary of Central, I really think the best is yet to come. I've seen so much good here of God's hand on the kingdom through Central and the work of Central. I really feel like as we step um, into these next years, um, that God is putting people in our path that just simply need to be loved. They need to know Jesus. I've uh, seen tens of thousands of lives changed in the last 35 years that I've been a part of Central. I can't wait to see what God does in the next 35 years. It's gonna be amazing. So I wanna leave you with this thought. You are the 26 now. Someday, God willing, Jesus doesn't return. Someday we'll, people will talk about you and the impact that you had on their life because you were involved and you served and you gave and you let Jesus use you in the faith community in a powerful way. And because of that, it will impact their lives and it will touch their lives. You're the 26. It's on us now. We're indebted to those who have gone before us, but now it's our responsibility. And if you're here today and you love this church and you're for it, but you've never really leaned in and become a part of it or contributed, or be, I need you to do that. We're rebuilding after COVID. We're trying to put ourselves back together after a really hard two years. And I need people who will shoulder in with us and say, let's go, let's take the hill together. I can't do it on my own, and I sure can't pull all of you guys up the hill with me. You gotta do it with me, and you are. You gotta lean in and allow God to work in your heart and in your life. You gotta step up and use your gifts. And if you'll do that, and I'll do that, together we'll represent the 26 really well. And God will use us in powerful ways. Let's bow and pray together. God, we love you. I thank you for your love for us. I pray your blessing over the next 60 years of Central. I pray that you will work powerfully through our church and faith community. God, use us, work through us, touch people's lives through us, and ultimately we pray that your fame and your name will go forward in every way. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen.